Hey everyone, before we get into the stories, I need to give a trigger warning for story number four, for not only physical abuse and assault, but also sexual assault. It's a dark one. I'll have the story labeled in the pinned comment if you want to avoid it. And remember, you can send your stories at southerncannibal.com. Now if you're all ready, let's get this going. And remember, to always, stay hungry. I'm not really sure what this should be considered, stalker or just a peeping Tom, but here's my story. In the late 90s, I was in high school, and during winter, I was finishing up a book report that I had been typing. The computer at the time was in our spare bedroom, which only faced out into our backyard. Like I mentioned, it was winter, and it was also during a really bad storm. My mom had just came in to tell me to hurry up and get ready for bed. We didn't have any blinds on the windows due to my mom remodeling the room. So when she came inside the room, she was staring out of the window, commenting on how bad it was storming out. As soon as she walked out, I was pretty much done with my report. So I went to save it to go over in the morning before printing it. As I was shutting down the computer though, something had caught my eye from outside. I remember looking out the window, then thinking, Oh, poor cat, is getting soaked in this rain. But not too long after, I began to realize that it wasn't a cat that I was looking at, as there wasn't a ledge anywhere for a cat to even sit on. And to my horror, I realized it was a grown man wearing some type of nylon mask over his face. I then screamed, flipped backwards out of the chair, and crawled out of the room as then my mom and dad came rushing into the room. I then began screaming that there was a man watching me through the window. My dad ran outside to the side of her house, opened the gate to the backyard, and then saw before the rain could wash away, by tracks that someone had been there, but that they had gotten away fast with their bicycle. So not only did they get into our backyard to watch me type a book report, but they also had to know that there was a window there. Here's the thing though, there's no way to know that unless you've been in our house or backyard before, and that's not even the most scary part. How many times had this happened before? Not to mention my mom was standing there looking out the window five minutes before. As a 16 year old girl, this was so traumatizing and I wouldn't stay home alone for a very long time. And I also slept on my parents' bedroom floor for like a month after this. I know it might not sound like anything to you, but when you have someone watching you with unknown intentions, don't be so damn quick to dismiss the creepiness of it all. Now, several years ago, I had broken up with my abusive ex who I had a child with just shortly before we broke up. After we broke up, he began constantly calling and texting me, begging me to take him back. I ended up getting a protective order after that and the police told him several times to leave me alone. One day I'm taking my kids to a clothing store, which only one was his, and it was for a seasonal change of wardrobe. As we were finishing up and heading to the front, I saw him in the store. He had no reason to be there, because he had no other children besides our one. He then ran at me heading to the checkout, begging and pleading at me as usual, paying no attention to his kid at all. I reminded him for the millionth time that he needed to get away from us. I called the local non-emergency number to report it, and they came and gave him a warning. Well, a month or so later, I was finishing up at the gym and heading to pick up my kids from the supervised kids area. And who do I see? Yeah, him again. Luckily, the kids area will only give children back to the registered guardian. So I took my kids and left the gym, with again him following me and begging and pleading for me to take him back, and he had also followed me halfway home in his car. As soon as I got home, I put my kids inside and locked all my doors, then reported him yet again, to the emergency this time. Both times I had video evidence, so this time they locked him up, but only for three days. What a joke. The next few days I spent the night with my kids in my boyfriend at the time's apartment, because I was way too scared to go home. 
It's been about six years, and I'm trying to move away now. I've never sued for child support or anything like that, in hopes that he would just go away and I never have to deal with him again. The past year, though, I've started having problems again, and he's trying to go to court to keep me from moving out of state with a kid that he's never even seen or even supported just to keep me around so he can watch me. I'm having to be super vigilant about my kids and who they're in contact with. I'm still dealing with this to this day, and it's an absolute nightmare. So for context, I'm a 38-year-old female, and the story happened when I was only 26. So we lived in Jersey, but my fiancé at the time, who's now my husband, had a house in Pennsylvania that we still go to to this day. My daughter was about two years old at the time, and there were about six couples who were also at the house. We had partied all weekend, and on this night in question, we decided that we wanted to finally relax. So all the men left an hour away to a friend's house, leaving just my sister, my best friend, and I to stay back and relax. It was about 7.30 p.m., and ironically, we were all telling scary stories to one another. Our kids were asleep, and I decided I wanted to go outside and have a cigarette. Now, let me explain you the layout of the house. We used the back door all day long. That's where we came in and out of and the front door always stays locked. The front of the house is set up kind of weirdly. There's not a lot of people around, but there are a few neighbors. Then you have the huge backyard that overlooks another neighbor, and then it's all woods. It's also very dark. Anyways, I light up my cigarette, and I get such a bad feeling while doing so. It was like I was being watched or something. All of a sudden, I then hear a faint sound very close to me, so I turned around, but I didn't see anything. But my gut was telling me to run inside and lock the door, so that's what I did. As I walked upstairs, I told my sister and best friend that I had a weird feeling about something, and then as we're talking, we had heard keys. Now, sometimes our husbands like to play jokes on us, so we thought it was just them playing a joke. So we then called them and asked if it was them. Well, they then told us it wasn't them, that they're literally an hour away from us. So we brushed it off. My best friend then starts to walk down the stairs at this point. We'll refer to her as S for privacy reasons. Now, we had these foggy kind of glass doors where you can see shadows in front of you, but you can't make out who it is. I then see someone jump in front as she's then going to open the door and I start screaming, then telling her do not open the door. She then runs up the stairs, and we all look at the window, and there's a guy there. The guy's laughing at us, and he appears to be tall. He's wearing a white t-shirt and blue jeans, and he's hopping from one bush to the other and laughing hysterically. Now we're definitely all scared. We call the police, but they're not in our town. They're an hour away from us in another town because we're in a very small town. I then take the kids and I put them in one room and I barricade the doors. I also grab a knife and right at that moment, we then hear the back door then open. Whoever this man was had gotten into the house and he's now coming up the stairs. I then ran to the bedroom where everybody is and I put a mattress against the door as I'm holding the knife. Well, luckily and miraculously, right at that same moment, we then see cop lights. I'm guessing once the intruder saw the cop lights, he ran right back downstairs, out the back door, and then ran through the woods. The police were now yelling for us to open the door, which of course I did. The cops looked around, but they never did find the guy, so I have no idea who the hell he was, what his intentions were, or where the hell he went. But yeah... That's my story, and it was one of the scariest nights of my life. To start my story, I'm a female, and I'm from South Africa. The place I live in is a roundabout in the heart of South Africa. It's also too small to really be called a city, and too big to be labeled as a town. But anyway, let's just call it a town for the purpose of this story. My town has a lot of biker gangs, 
and being a big fan of those iron horses, mingling with bikers was kind of the place to hang out when I was in my 20s. I met a lot of bikers from every gang, men and women, and I became very good friends with a lot of them. I didn't ride myself at the time, but being in those crowds made me feel really welcome and at home. That's of course also how I met the boyfriend, who I want to tell you about in this story. I'm sure that we can all agree that stalker and psychotype humans unfortunately don't wear labels that warn you beforehand that you're entering a dangerous zone when getting involved with them, and that was exactly the case here. He first came off as such a true gentleman, and we could talk for hours on end, and then slowly, you start to see little cracks in their personalities, and you think, oh, it's just my imagination, it can't really be that bad. That is until one day when your eyes finally open and you realize you're smack in the middle of a situation and you have no idea how to get out safely. This boyfriend in question who we'll call Will had all the right things going to let any girl fall for him. He had good looks, a bright yellow Suzuki speed bike, great income, his own place, a badass BMW, and a nice smile. You know what I'm talking about the works. He was perfect. And then the bonus. I lived in a flat in a cul-de-sac, and he literally lived on the opposite side of me on the same street. First, there was just little things. Like, he went to a bar, and he would sit me down at the bar counter, buying me a drink, and then leave me there to roam and chat with all of his friends. I would, of course, start conversations with all the people around me, then at some point during the night, he would ask me if I'm making plans to sleep with everyone I talked to. I very quickly defended myself the first time that happened, but soon after, I learned that it didn't matter what I said when he asked me that. The answer was the starting point for a fight. Later on, he would ask me during the day about my coworkers and all the other people that I would be in contact with. I also started to notice that he would drop me off at work and then park close by and sit in the car to watch my place of work the whole time. Then things got even worse. He would lock me in his house and leave, and then come back completely drunk, then passing out on the kitchen floor. And then the next morning, I would be in trouble for leaving him on the floor and for whoring the whole night. Bear in mind, he was a big guy, six foot something, and well built. I'm merely five foot two and small of stature, he would tell me that he knows exactly who came and visited me when he wasn't there. That's when I began to realize that this man had some serious mental issues as he locked me in. There's also burglar bars in front of all the windows, so I couldn't even get out through a window. How did I get visitors to whore around with when I was literally a prisoner in his house? One morning after one of these outbursts from him, I told him to go screw himself, and I started to make my way to the door. He pulled me by my hair, and he pulled me back so hard that I actually heard a pop somewhere in my neck. Luckily, nothing broke, but as he pulled me towards him with just one of his hands, the other hand went around my throat as he then angrily whispered in my ear that I don't have permission to leave, with the grip around my throat getting tighter. I was in shock. I couldn't move a single muscle. He then pushed me away so hard that I lost my balance, then landing on the floor hurting my wrist very badly. He then pulled out his gun, and he pointed it at me, making a pretend shot, smirked, and then walked away. He only ever allowed me to go to my own place when I said I had to go get medicine that I needed. He would then stand on his front porch, and then watch me until I came back. This all went on for a while, until I eventually convinced him that he's going to get in trouble if I don't go back to work. He let me go very reluctantly, and he would still park outside my work for long periods of time, and he would sometimes come inside my work pretending to be the very loving boyfriend that he wanted everyone to believe he was, bringing me food and snacks. At this point in time, I was making all sorts of plans in my head to get away from him. One Saturday when I was still at work, some of his friends got him drunk, so he decided to go to a bike rally without me. By this time, I had known for a while that he had been constantly cheating on me. And to be completely honest, it didn't really bother me one bit. 
my one and only goal was to get away from him as safely as possible. He had phoned me to let me know that he was at the rally and that he'll check up on me later. I went home and enjoyed my freedom for a bit. But during the early morning hours, around 5 a.m., he then burst right through my front door. I was asleep, and I woke up from the noise. He stormed into my room with his gun in his hand, grabbed me by my hair, pulled my head back, and then held the gun under my chin. He was absolutely convinced that I had someone with me, and I was cheating on him. I managed to calm him down a little, and I told him to search my house for whoever he thought was there. Whenever he couldn't find anyone in my flat, he then sexually assaulted me. This was when I realized that this man was going to kill me at some point, and I had to get out now. After he finished assaulting me, he finally passed out on my bed. I got up and got dressed, and I got in my car, driving to one of my female biker friends' home. She was a lot older than me, and more wiser, so I told her everything. She believed me, as she could see all of the bruise marks on my neck and arms. I then told her that I wanted out of the relationship with him, but that I didn't know how. She had called her husband, and she asked him to go to my place and get Will out of my flat. Her husband Jake and a couple of the other bikers actually had to carry Will over across the street to his own place, then dumping him on his front porch. One thing that I can say about most of the bikers around here as they didn't tolerate Will's kind of behavior towards women, especially since he was loudly telling everyone who wanted to hear at the rally what he planned to do with me if I ever left him. Jake later told me that he didn't take Will seriously, as he was drunk. But when my friend Sophia phoned him, and then told him what Will did after he left the rally, he was furious with Will. Jake and the others helped me pack up my things in my flat, and they also relocated me to another flat just a few houses down from Will. This was an empty flat in the backyard of Sophia's parents' house, and she said I could stay there until I find another place where Will won't bother me. However, Will didn't stop trying to find me, even after he made one of the women he cheated on me with pregnant. They were even engaged, and he would still drive around looking for me. I changed jobs, got a new phone number, even sold my car and got a new one, but I would still sometimes look out the window of my flat and see his bike drive past, looking on both sides of the road if he can spot where I might be. I stopped going to all my friends' gatherings, and I'd ask my friends to do my shopping for me, just so that I didn't have to accidentally bump into Will somewhere. Even after he and the other woman got married, he would still ask some of our mutual friends where I am and how I'm doing. Jake had once asked him if he's ever going to stop fussing over me, and he apparently told Jake that we still have unfinished business. I honestly don't know why it took me so long to ask for help. I realized early on in the relationship that I didn't really have strong feelings for him. About five years after that night, I had bumped into Will at a butchery, and I almost had a heart attack. He was, however, so very friendly towards me and he was apparently very happy to see that I'm taking good care of myself. And he told me that him and his wife are very happy, and how he has a son now. I couldn't care less about this. I just wanted to get the hell away from him. Then he asked me where I currently live. I stayed calm, and I told him I live in another city about four hours away from here now, and that I'm only here visiting a friend for the weekend. I lied, of course but I could see on his face he didn't like my answer. As he grabbed my upper arm and pulled me closer to him, his wife came up behind him and then told him very aggressively to leave me the hell alone and that they needed to go. He did a kind of motion with his hands, like I was a piece of paper or something that he was throwing away. As he was getting in the car, his wife gave me a death stare, and as they drove off, I couldn't help myself, but I started laughing. Apparently, he met someone crazier than he was, and he was afraid of her. That strangely made me feel all warm and tingly inside. Needless to say, it took me a very long time to recover from that trauma Will put me through. When I heard a year later that he died in a bike accident, I was honestly glad that I could finally really stop looking over my shoulder every minute of every day. 
It also helped in my recovery to know that he would never be a problem for me again. However, after hearing all these similar stories on this channel, I'm honestly fine just being single, and I'm enjoying my life the way that I should. Thank you all for listening, and please be safe out there. Hey everyone, I hope you all enjoyed these stories. If you ever want to submit your own, you can do so at southerncannibal.com. Have a good night, everyone. And remember, to always, stay.